Nobel laureates in physics and chemistry, laureates in economic sciences, your excellencies, members of the academy, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, I wish you all welcome to the 2022 Nobel Lectures in Physics and Chemistry and the lectures of the Sveriges Riksbank Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel. Alfred Nobel devoted in 1895 his fortune to five international prizes, reflecting his own international experiences and activities. The first Nobel Prize was awarded in 1901, over 120 years ago. And the Nobel Prizes in Physics and Chemistry are awarded for discoveries, inventions and improvements that have conferred the greatest benefit to humankind. The Sveriges Riksbank Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel was instituted in 1968. And this year, we are most happy that we can all meet physically for the Nobel Prize and Economy Prize lectures and the prize awarding ceremony. The past years, since 2020, when the COVID-19 pandemic started, have influenced enormously our possibilities to meet and interact and to present and discuss science. Fortunately, the Nobel Prizes have been awarded but with smaller ceremonies and in different locations around the globe. But now, finally, we can all meet here in person in Stockholm. The present year, 2022, we hoped would be calmer. With the decrease of the pandemic, since we now have access to vaccines against COVID-19. Indeed, it's fantastic that we managed to develop vaccines during the ongoing pandemic. And this has surely saved millions of lives. But year 2022 became very dramatic with the war ongoing in Europe, a humanitarian catastrophe, an energy crisis and an increasing inflation. And on top of this, the climate change crisis with the warming of the climate and the problem with the increase of carbon dioxide in atmosphere and extreme weather in many different locations around the world. And this turbulent world that we are living in even more strengthens our endeavor to make new discoveries, inventions and improve them that will benefit humankind. And stresses also that research must be international. Science is driven by curiosity to explore and to investigate and to discover new knowledge. And the roads to discovery can be long and winding but can also lead to surprises and openings that were not considered and to wonderful possibilities. And we have seen groundbreaking discoveries during the years and we will now have the privilege and honor to listen to exceptional researchers and laureates who have increased our knowledge dramatically and broadened our views in three different areas of research. Quantum mechanics is an important field that starts to find applications. And in this year's Nobel Prize in Physics, the laureates have discovered that two particles behave like a single unit, even though they are separated and far apart. And this has opened a large field of research that includes quantum computers and quantum networks and paved the way for new technologies based on quantum information. In the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, the laureates have laid the foundation for a new functional form of chemistry called click chemistry, in which molecular building blocks snap together fast and efficiently. And this technology has huge commercial potentials and can accelerate the drug discovery process. In the Economic Prize, the laureates have made important discoveries that improve how society deals with financial crisis. And they have shown the importance of the role of banks in the economy and why avoiding bank collapses is vital during financial crisis. And all these achievements not only bring knowledge and deeper understanding, but also allow us to improve our societies in multiple ways and to take wiser decisions. And we will now listen to these prize lectures by exceptional researchers on 
whose shoulders present and future humans can stand, and new giants in research will surely arise. So once again, most welcome, and my warmest congratulations also to the laureates. So I now invite my colleague in the Academy of Sciences, Professor Anders Ilbeck, who is the chairperson of the Nobel Committee for Physics, to introduce the laureates in physics. So thank you. The focus of this year's Nobel Prize in Physics is quantum mechanical entanglement. Uh, Alain Aspect, Jon Clauser and Anton Zeilinger, this year's Nobel laureates in Physics, have taught us how particles that are in entangled states can be investigated and controlled. Already in the early years of quantum mechanics, entanglement stood out as a key property of the theory with non-intuitive consequences, possibly indicating that hidden variables were missing in the quantum mechanical description. <coughs> Later on, in the 1960s, John Stuart Bell made a theoretical discovery that hidden variables theories, assuming locality, cannot explain the quantum mechanical predictions. This year's laureates have, through groundbreaking experiments with entangled photons, established the violation of Bell inequalities. In addition, their methods have paved the way for quantum information science and a new era in quantum technology, where intense research is underway to build quantum computers, improve measurements, and establish secure quantum encrypted communication. Our first speaker is Alain Aspin. Uh, he was born in Achen, Lut et Garonne, France, in 1947. He studied undergraduate physics at the Ecole Normale Supérieure de Cachan and also at Université d'Orsay, from which he received a PhD in 1983. Uh, he is currently Auguste Fresnel Professor at Institut d'Optique at the Université Paris-Saclay and professor at École Polytechnique Palaiso. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Alain Aspect to the stage to tell us about the development that led to this year's prize. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, so this lecture will be about entanglement, how entanglement nowadays becomes a tool, and how uh, images as strange as non-locality can help having, it's not a little too strong, no, it's okay. Uh, how, how the concept of non-locality can help having intuitions about these applications of entanglement. So the story of entanglement as a, a milestone in uh, 1935 when Einstein and Bohr started discussing and uh, Schrodinger added his grain of salt and the conclusion was that entanglement is really amazing. But it took another almost 30 years for John Stuart Bell to discover that not only it's amazing, but it's different from any 
previous mysterious behavior of quantum mechanics, and this was with the famous Bell's inequality. I think it's a little too strong. Okay. And then another 20 years almost, and Friedman, uh, Feynman recognized that entanglement being different, probably we can do something with it. And he published this famous paper, which is considered the founding paper for, let's say, quantum computing. And so there is a problem. Huh? C'est la photo lunette. Ah bon, d'accord. Voilà. Merci. And this is maybe part of a new quantum revolution. So let us start. We, I will uh, explain what is the einstein polsky rosen situation. I will present it with photons. Bell theorem, and then the experiments that have been done with photon, of course, focusing on our experiments, and a comment about, in my opinion, the interest of thinking with images of non-locality. So let us start. You all have heard that Einstein had, a, Einstein had a problem with quantum mechanics. Well, I should start my clock, because otherwise I will speak too long, you know. People who know me know that. Okay. Einstein had a problem with quantum mechanics uh, that he was worried that quantum mechanics makes a probabilistic uh, prediction. He fully agreed on the result of the calculation, but he thought that a theory that makes probabilistic prediction cannot be an ultimate theory. It, can be, it must be a, a kind of statistical theory but there should be below description of individual objects. Like for instance, in this room, if I think of the velocity of the molecule which are here, I can describe by a probability, what is the probability that the velocity is between 300 meters, 310, etc. But we have no doubt that each molecule has its own velocity. That's probably what he had in mind. And he made all efforts to find situations in which, by logical reasoning, he came to the conclusion that you need to introduce this underlying level. There is a famous Solvay conference of 1927 where he tried, and each time Bohr replied successfully, saying, no, 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 you cannot describe more precisely. But this was about a single particle. In 1935, he came with a new situation involving two particles, two entangled particles, and then, once again, he came to the conclusion that you need to complete the theory, and in spite of the denegation of uh, Niels Bohr, one could say that the situation was unsettled. So what is the einstein polosky rosen situation with photons as the experiment that we have done? You have a photon going to the left, a photon going to the right, and we are going to you to make a polarization measurement. So this is a polarizer. If a beam of light polarized along the direction of the axis of the polarizer, light will go along plus one channel. If it is polarized perpendicular to A, it will go into the minus one channel. And if it is polarized at an angle with A, a fraction will go up and a fraction will go down. But if now I have a single photon, a single photon cannot be split. You cannot have a fraction of the photon up and a fraction down. And so comes the probability. If you have a single photon, you have a certain probability to go up and a certain probability to go down. And these are single probabilities. And there is another kind of probability, which is extremely important, is a joint probability. Probability for a given pair, what is the probability to get plus one here and plus one here? This is called the joint probability for polarizer in the angle A, in the direction AB. Now comes entanglement. 
What Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen found is that this state is permitted by the formalism, by the mathematics of quantum physics. Why is it interesting? A state XX would describe two photons polarized like that. A state YY would describe two photons polarized like that. <coughs> but the superposition of XX and YY, I cannot tell you it's like that or like that. The point is that these states cannot be factorized, and because it cannot be factorized, you cannot attribute a given property to the first one and a given property to the second one. This is entanglement. When you have a state like that, it's an elementary exercise in quantum physics to calculate the various probabilities, single probabilities and <coughs> joint probabilities. And I will focus on the case where the two polarizers are parallel to each other, so the angle AB is zero. Single probabilities are one half, and joint probabilities are one half for P plus plus and P minus minus. And this means perfect correlation. Maybe you are not fully convinced because one half does not look as a perfect correlation, but look. Here, the probability to get plus one is one half. And the probability to get plus one and plus one is also one half, which means that the conditional probability to get plus one on the second side, once you have obtained plus one on the first side, this conditional probability is perfect, is 100%. Okay. Now comes the question that naive physicists like me ask all the time. Okay, I have the result of a calculation. I would like to understand, and in my mind, understanding means making an image which makes sense. And the problem is that the standard way to doing this calculation does not allow me to make an image which makes sense. And the reason is that when you have two entangled particles, the calculation is done in an abstract space, a mathematical space, called the Hilbert space tensor product of the space for each particle, whatever, it's an abstract space. And it's very difficult to make an image in our space starting from that space, except that there is a... And so, <coughs> it's annoying. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry for people who, that I wake up, okay. <laughs> It's annoying to, to, um, not to be able to make images because as a famous quantum optics theorist said, quantum phenomena do not happen in a Hilbert space. They happen in a real laboratory and a, a laboratory is our space. So I insist, I want an image in our space. And there is a way to do that. It's a st standard quantum calculation, a little more complicated. We will separate the two measurements. We will first make a measurement here, and then a second measurement here. And the first result, uh, measurement here can give either result plus one or minus one, and we assume the polarizer along x, and so result plus one corresponds to polarization x, result minus one corresponds to polarization y. Now, what I do is that I must use the so-called projection postulate, which tells me that just after the measurement, then I must project the initial state onto the eigenstate associated to the result. Let's do it for the first case. For the first case, the result is xx. Now it's no longer an entangled state. It's a state where the two photons are like that. So I know that the second photon is like that. If the result was y, then the projection would give y, y, and now I know that the two photons are like that and the second photon is like that. Okay. So, we know that immediately after this measurement, the second photon falls, to, to, so to speak, in a state which is the same as we found here. And then, of course, it's trivial to find that you will get the full correlation because if you find plus one here, you find plus one here, etc., etc. So we fully recover the prediction of quantum mechanics, but in addition, now even we have an image in our space, reduction here, etc. But there is a catch. 
the measurement on the first photon seems to influence instantaneously at a distance the state of new two. And of course, this was unacceptable for Einstein. And this is why Einstein said we must add something to quantum physics. So let's go to try to add something, and this was Bell theorem. The idea is the following. When I have two measurements at a distance, which are strongly correlated on two objects which were emitted from the first place, it's very natural to say, okay, when they were emitted, they have a joint property, and it is this joint property that determines the result. For instance, we could have a photon from the beginning xx, and then we are going to have plus one, plus one. We could have uh, yy, and we are going to have minus one, minus one. So the idea is to introduce this supplementary parameter completing quantum mechanics, finding an underlying structure. <coughs> and uh, uh, this is uh, an idea, if you think of it, which is very natural. Our colleagues in biology have no doubt that if you measure color of eyes or some diseases on twin brother, the reason why you find a perfect correlation is that they have the same chromosome. So the idea is that there may be some kind of chromosome for the two photons to understand this correlation. Bohr disagreed. Why did he disagree? Because he had the deep feeling, intuition, call it as you want, that if he would accept to complete quantum mechanics, it would no longer be self-consistent. But it seems to me, when you read Bohr, that it was a deep conviction. It was certainly not a demonstration as clear-cut as the one of the Solvay Conference of 1927. And so you could stay with the idea that it was a discussion between Einstein and Bohr. But 30 years later, well, 29 years later, Bell came and said, OK, let us take seriously the uh, proposition that to understand the correlation, we must introduce supplementary parameter. And so we are going to introduce a function whose value is plus one or minus one, depending on lambda and on the orientation of the polarizer. Similarly here, and <coughs> of course, the various pairs don't have the same lambda, so you, we need to introduce a density of probability, which is well behaved. And now if we want to calculate the so-called correlation coefficient, it's nothing else than the average of the product AB over these various lambda. This is John Bell in front of a nice scheme of experiment with, whoops, sorry. And uh, Bell theorem says that no local hidden variable theory, that is to say, no theory completed in the idea that you have a common property, which is local, I will come to this point, can reproduce all quantum mechanical predictions for the einstein polosky rosen correlations. This is how it works. Bell can demonstrate that if we express the correlation coefficient with the capital A and capital B, and we consider two orientations on the first side, A and A prime, two orientations on the second side, B and B prime, and we look at the four possibility, A, B, A, B prime, etc. Then, this quantity S that you calculate with the capital A, capital B, and rho cannot be bigger than two or less than minus two. But let us look at the quantum mechanical prediction for this coefficient. This is calculated by the one half of cosine squared, etc. Quantum mechanics predicts that the, for a perfect EPR state, this correlation coefficient takes this value. And now consider this special set of orientation with an angle pi over eight here, here, here. If you put that and calculate it, it's not a difficult exercise you will find that S is equal to 2 root 2, which is obviously bigger than 2, which means that no local hidden variable theory can reproduce 
this quantum mechanical prediction uh, for this set of angles. And now, the possibility to complete quantum mechanics is no longer uh, a matter of taste. Up to this point, you could think that, okay, Einstein and Bohr disagree on how to interpret it, but both agree on the result of the calculation. So if you are pragmatic, you are in your lab, in your lab, you do experiment, you explain it with quantum mechanics, as my friend Bill Phillips say, shut up and calculate and observe what you have. Okay. I cannot resist showing that the demonstration of Bell's inequality is so simple that everybody should uh, understand that it is simple. The idea is very simple. You want to calculate the average of cis quantity, and you are going to consider the four possibilities with A, A prime, and B, and B prime. And the quantity that will give the quantity S that we hope is obtained as an average, an average of this formula. And honestly, to demonstrate that this can only be plus two or minus two is an exercise of a high school uh, pupil, okay? Because here, look, it's just that, and it will be either plus two or minus two. And then you take the average. And it's not rocket science to understand that the average of a number, which is either plus two or minus two, has to be between plus two and minus two. So you see, Bell's inequality is really something extremely simple. Cannot be wrong. I speak several times of locality, and Bell's locality condition is the following. To demonstrate his inequality, he needs explicitly to assume that capital A cannot depend on B, capital B cannot depend on A, and this, which means that the result of the measurement here cannot depend on the orientation of the other polarizer, and vice versa. And moreover, the way in which pairs are emitted here cannot depend on the orientation of the polarizer that will make the measurement. This makes sense, of course. However, how do we know that there is no interaction between the various parts of the experiment? And so, in his founding paper, Bell insisted that if you could do an experiment with polarizers whose orientation are modified during the flight of the photon, you change the orientation, and then there is no possibility, according to Einstein's relativity, that there is an influence from here to there, and even less an influence of the orientation onto the way it was emitted before. So, this was in the conclusion of Bell paper. And really, it seems to me, this wire was so interesting, this, this conclusion, it seems to me that in an experiment with variable polarizer, we address a full conflict between quantum mechanics and Einstein's worldview, which is physical reality and locality based on relativity. Okay, so it is time to go to experiments. And of course, here I will be fast because my colleagues are also going to describe experiments. There were two sets of experiments. The pioneers, and John Clauser is here, and Ed Fry is here also. It was between 72 and 76. Then there is a series of Institute Optic experiments in 81 and 82. I started in 75, but the experiments were in 81 and 82. And uh, Jean Dalibar and Philippe Grangier, who participated in the experiment, are here also. And then there was other set of experiment, and including the experiment of Anton Zalinger and colleagues, and he will express that, he will explain us. So these are the pioneers. I will go fast because I am sure that John will go in, uh, in detail. But <coughs> the idea is that this experiment found that quantum mechanics is upheld and that uh, Bell's inequality are violated. However, these experiments were still 
quite far from the ideal scheme that I presented at the beginning. It was fantastic, but it was not yet the scheme. And this is the reason why I embarked into this program with the goal to develop experiments as close as possible as the ideal scheme of the theorist. And to make a long story short, this was the core of the experiment. Many laser, anatomic beam, etc. But at the end, it was possible to excite calcium atoms to this level. John Clauser and Stuart Friedman has also done that, but in that time, they did not have the lasers that I had, and so they excited here, and sometimes they have the right pair of photons, and other times they did not have it. With this two-photon excitation, it was fantastic, because it was a very pure source, and moreover, very intense we could get a hundred of coincidence of real signal per second. Maybe you are not impressed. A hundred per second? Well, think. hundred second gives you 10 to the 4. And now the statistical accuracy with 10 to the 4 is 1%. So in less than two minutes, we got a 1% accuracy. John, it took him hours to have, or maybe we, days, days to, 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 to have this accuracy. So this was a good starting point, and of course we repeated his experiment, and we confirmed that uh, uh, the experiment of John and of Ed Fry uh, indeed were working, because our first scheme was like their experiment. Then comes the first original experiment. In all previous experiments, the polarizers were polarizer where you get the plus one result, but the minus one result is lost. And this obliges to make auxiliary calibrations, which complicated the situation. Here, I could afford to have uh, beam splitters, which are polarization beam splitters. So in other words, it's a polarizer like the ideal one I presented on my ideal scheme, where the result plus one is detected here, and the result minus one is detected here. And now it's fantastic, because in a single run, with orientation A and B, you have the four counting rates. And once you have the four counting rates, you are all you need. The correlation coefficient is nothing else that this numerator plus for similar result minus for diagonal result, okay? And it's self calibrated. You plug into the denominator the sum of the four number, and that's it. No auxiliary calibration. And this experiment was done by Philippe Rangier in his uh, master thesis. And the result is here. It's absolutely fantastic. The green curve is a prediction of quantum mechanics, taking into account the slight inefficiency of the experiment. Polarizers are not perfect. You have solid angles. It's detailed. We know how to calculate it. Philippe can tell you that we calculated that before, and then we did the measurement, and it came exactly on that curve and the violation of Bell's inequality was by more than 40 standard deviations. You know, in CERN, when they have something at three standard deviations, they leak the information that there may be something. And at five standard deviations, they are happy and they publish. Here, it was 40 standard deviations, so no discussion. But now, you understand that uh, my initial goal was to make an experiment in which we change the orientation of the polarizers. And uh, this is the kind of polarizer we have. Uh, we have them in the windows of uh, Institute Optique. Uh, and it's a piece of equipment like that with uh, LED screens, etc., like 50 kilograms, okay? We are not going to rotate 50 kilograms in 10 nanoseconds. So the idea was the following. If we could build a switch which either let light go to a first polarizer in orientation A or to a second polarizer in orientation A prime, if the switch is fast enough, it's equivalent to a single polarizer switch from A to A prime back to A, etc. Same on the second side, and that's it. The, in the experiment we had, the time between two switching was 10 nanoseconds, and 10 nanoseconds is defi definitely less than the 
the time it takes for light or for the photon to go from the source to here, which was 20 nanoseconds in our experiment and 40 nanoseconds between both ends. This is one of the switches that we built. Actually, there is a first version of these switches which has been given to the Nobel Museum. So if you go to the Nobel Museum, maybe you can see it. The experiment was a little more difficult. It was a little longer. We had to accumulate for tens of minutes rather than minutes, but uh, okay, it worked. And at the end, we found a violation of Bell's inequality by six standard deviations. And for the first time, Bell's inequality had been tested with polarizer set at the last moment. I will just say a few words of the third generation of experiment because I am sure that Anton will uh, elaborate on that. There was again a big progress on the source of entanglement. My source was better than the previous one, but their source was much better. The idea was to use a nonlinear phenomenon called parametric down conversion. The important thing is the following. Because of some technical feature, which is called phase matching, the two photons are emitted, the two entangled photons are emitted in extremely well-defined direction and you can inject them into optical fiber. And once it is injected in optical fiber, then you can stretch the fiber for hundreds of meters. And this is what uh, Anton and Greg Weiss did in, uh, in Innsbruck. He will explain that. And here I just want to say that the same year, Nicolas Gizeng was able to inject his photon in the commercial network of Swiss Telecom and to observe entanglement at 30 kilometers, which is amazing. Okay, there have been a lot of discussion about loophole, loophole-free experiments, etc. I have no time to comment about that, but eventually, in 2015, there were three experiments published closing the, the loopholes, and Anton was one of them. And if you want to know more about it, you can look for this paper, which is uh, easy to find on the web. It's the news and views Competing competitor of the one of nature, it's the news and views uh, of the American Physical Society. So here you have my comments about these experiments. So Einstein's local realism is untenable. Violating Bell's inequality means that you cannot stick to the point of view of Einstein. What can we conclude? Well, Einstein himself told us Einstein did not believe in what he said. Yes, he was reasoning ad absurdum. He told us, if I was not right, this is what you would have to accept. But now we know that we have to accept it. And what we have to accept, these are the words of Einstein, basically, it's the fact that when you do something on the first system, it instantly reacts on the other one. This is called non-locality, quantum non-locality. And for concluding, I'm just going to show you one example of why I think that non-locality is fruitful as an image. It's about quantum cryptography. Cryptography is the fact that two friends, Alid and Bob, want to communicate, and you have a spy, an eavesdropper, who wants to intercept the message. And they want to be sure that nobody can read their message, can understand their message. And for that, there is a method which has been demonstrated by Shannon as absolutely sure that a method called one-time pad in which Alice and Bob have two identical series of random zero and one. Alice uses series to code, uh, Bob uses same series for decode, and you can demonstrate, it's a mathematical demonstration, that it is absolutely sure. It's absolutely sure, provided that the message, sorry for that, too fast, provided that the message is not longer than the key, because otherwise there are regularity, and the people, who, the, the, the eavesdropper are very smart, and they are going to find a solution out of it. So the point is how to distribute two identical keys to Alice and Bob, who were far apart, 
without the eavesdropper being able to make a copy of the key, because if he makes a copy, uh, then it will be easy to decipher the message. Entangle photon our solution. This is a method of Arthur Ricard. You remember what I told you? Uh, if Alice and Bob have the same direction for their polarizer, either you get plus one and then you get plus one, or you get minus one and you get minus one, and each is absolutely random. So you have two identical series of random numbers. Now, what about the spy? Why is it safe? It's safe for the following reason. If you believe what I told you, non-locality, it's at the very last moment that you get plus one or minus one and immediately you get the same thing on the other side. There is nothing to spy in between. The decision, the result is not yet here. Okay? And so there is nothing to spy on the flying photon, but because it's only at the last moment that you will have the result. So here, non-locality, tells us it should be safe. Of course, there is a big demonstration when it is finished, mathematics and everything, but in my opinion, all the idea is here, and this is why I like non-locality. This kind of experiment has been demonstrated at more than 1,000 kilometers by John Weipan from the satellite launched by the Chinese. So, conclusion, non-local images provide fruitful intuitions. And to conclude, I have several thanks. First, of course, these people, because it is these people who showed, who pointed out the extraordinary character of entanglement, which is now at work in developing quantum technologies. I want to thank two master students who participated in the experiment, I already named Philippe Brangier, but there is also Jean Dalibar. You don't recognize them, so if you want to talk to them, because both are here, now they rather look like that, okay? <laughs> I, of course, want to thank two engineers, one in mechanics and optics, one in electronics, who were uh, very helpful to develop the experiment. I had a lot of equipment built in the workshop of Institute Optique and also from the workshop of Centre Etude Nucléaire de Saclay. It was not perfectly legal, but now it's more than 30 years ago, so <laughs> I, ca I, can, I can say it. I want to mention Christian Ember, who was professor at Institute Optique. He was the one who handed me the paper of John Bell, saying, look into that, there may be something interesting for you. And that was a starting point. And then at that time, when I decided to embark into that, there were many criticisms that it was useless research, etc. and he always protected me. Unfortunately, he passed away, but I owe him a lot. I owe a lot to the book of Claude Coentanuji, Bernardieu, and Franck Galloway, because it is a book in which I learned quantum mechanics, which allowed me, when I read the paper of John Bell, to totally understand the quantum reasoning in the paper of John Bell. And Claude Coentanuji also educated me a lot by his lecture at Collège de France. It's very well known in the medium, and for me it's crucial. You know, I never learned quantum mechanics or quantum optics at school or at university. I learned it by this way. And last and not least, I want to thank my family, and especially Annie, who supported me, my children, who accepted maybe my too long hours in the lab, okay? And I think that they are very important for this success. Thank you very much. She told me to go the other side, but uh, <laughs> she cannot control me. Hmm? Nice. Thank you. <laughs> Switch off. Your mic's not on. Uh, he was born in Pasadena. Sorry. So our next speaker is... 
John Clauser. Uh, he was born in Pasadena, California, US, in 1942. Uh, he studied undergraduate physics at Caltech and Columbia University, New York, uh, and received a PhD in physics from Columbia University in 1969. Uh, from 1969 to 1997, he worked at University of California, Berkeley, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Uh, he is pres presently research physicist at his own private lab in Walnut Creek, California. Uh, so please join me in welcoming John Clauser to the stage to tell us about the development that led to this year's prize. Connected. No. That's we're not. Something is not right. Uh, let me start over again then here. Okay. Okay. Uh, what I did in all of this was the first experiments to actually uh, test what uh, John Bell ha had uh, shown us was probably one of the most important uh, discoveries, uh, I would think, of uh, the, the recent decade, or the recent uh, century, if, if in fact. The, so, these are, uh, so I will discuss the experiments. And then, a, in order to uh, understand the experiments, Mike Horn and I developed the, what's now called the theory of local realism, which is, in essence, Einstein's whole program for uh, doing physics. And unfortunately, it's wrong, which is what the experiments show. And finally, I will end with the, uh, does this work? Yeah. Uh, discussion of why I still am totally confused about what's going on with quantum mechanics. Okay, let me start with the question is, what is quantum mechanics? What is quantum entanglement? Okay, uh, quantum entanglement uh, started out with Schrodinger. Schrodinger produced not one, but two important equations. He started out with the first uh, equation, f which was for single particles. The, in particular, hydrogen, which has a single electron. And it, miraculously, it described the, stru the structure and the energy levels of hydrogen. But more complicated, was helium, which had two electrons. So he produces a, 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 a second uh, equation, which now involves two electrons. The two are very different equations. The second one allows quantum entanglement, which is a new equa uh, solutions emerged from, from the second equation. And the peculiar peculiarity is that the two electrons are now intimately uh, correlated. At the time, nobody suggested doing any experiments to test this rather bizarre prediction. 
However, both Einstein and Schrodinger were very disturbed by this phenomenon. And, in fact, uh, Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen in 35 proposed the addition of additional variables to quantum mechanics to, in order to explain what's going on. Niels Bohr, on the other hand, said, no, they're not needed. And uh, I discussed all of this very nicely. So one of the question, first questions I was asked when I was talking about this in the uh, Swedish embassy uh, a couple of weeks ago was, what is the Bell inequality? This is what we, in fact, uh, tested. There's not one, but there's actually three important Bell inequalities that I will talk about. The first, of course, was John Bell's 1964 uh, inequality that uh, uh, Alain described very nicely. There's one problem with <laughs> be, of the theory. Uh, in order to be useful, a theory must make an experimental prediction. And unfortunately, uh, John Bell's uh, uh, paper made no experimental con uh, predictions because it made, demanded a perfect experiment and, uh, which, which had certain uh, certainty in the outcomes. And as uh, Ben Franklin pointed out, <laughs> the only things certain in life are, or in nature are death and taxes. Unfortunately, this is not death in Texas. So, the, uh, uh, with uh, help from uh, my associates, uh, Mike Horn, uh, Admiral Shimoni, and Dick Holt, who is uh, here in the, in the audience, uh, uh, we uh, uh, produced the uh, Clouser, Horn, Shimoni, Holt, now commonly referred to as CHSH inequality which was made the uh, first real ex uh, testable experimental prediction. So, and we proposed a detailed experiment to do that. And we noticed various important loopholes, uh, one of which, of course, was I mentioned uh, that he tested, but a very important loophole was that the data really couldn't violate the inequality on their own, so we had to add some additional uh, assumptions. So, the third inequality is now uh, the, was uh, produced by Mike Horn and I uh, in 1974, and it is the first loophole-free, experimentally testable uh, uh, inequality. Okay, let's so start with the first one. Uh, Alan has already uh, noticed. Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen, had always, and, and others, had always assumed that, that quantum mechanics always made uh, correct predictions. The grand irony of this uh, Bell's paper is that he uh, showed that Einstein's original uh, intent of that paper was exactly the opposite of what was true. That the, if they wanted to show that, that the correct predictions led to uh, the need for hidden variables. And what Bell showed was that if you put hidden variables in, then you can't get the uh, uh, predictions of quantum mechanics. So, uh, and again, I said it was not really testable. So, uh, CHSH in 1969, we were inspired by th this work and said, wondered, well, is, can, can we really relieve uh, uh, the, get rid of Einstein's requirement for a, a perfect ex experiment? And indeed, we found, that, yes, we could. And so we designed an experiment uh, to actually test it. We worked out all the details of what, you, uh, you needed to do in order to test it. Uh, and that was the first uh, actual hard experimental prediction. Uh, and it doesn't use, require uh, Bell's uh, impossible to achieve its conditions. 
So uh, we now have two theories, two different sets of predictions, quantum mechanics and uh, Bell's uh, this EH inequalities prediction. So being an experimentalist, let's actually do an experiment and find out which one is true. So in order to do this, we had to add a, a, some minor supplementary conditions, but they were, we believe that they were of quite reasonable and rather weak. Okay, the third inequality is the CH, or the Clauser-Horn inequality that was uh, developed in 1974, uh, and it was to test uh, what is now called local realism. We, wanted to, we wondered, when we were doing the experiments, we wondered what is really being tested here? Is it just the addition of hidden variables? Or is it something more profound than that? And we found that indeed it is far more profound. It was a test of Einstein's whole platform for doing physics that we effectively were putting him, him out of business. And so when we, and in fact, the theory when we develop it was effectively dead on arrival. It was already refuted. But nonetheless, so we tried to put it in as clear as possible set of terms as we could. So, and in the process, we formulated a new inequality, the, the CH inequality, and it allows loophole-free tests. So, uh, now, if, if with some even milder ex, uh, additional assumptions, then the first experiments that, uh, uh, that I had done, uh, 72 and 76, uh, actually knocked it out so that it was already dead. More recently, and it's taken a, a long time because the technology did not exist at all to, to, in order to test it in 1974, uh, it has now been tested conclusively. With, so now without any loopholes at all, one can say, uh, and I agree with the last early uh, conclusion, it's dead, Jim. So. What are some of the experiments? Uh, there are three important ones uh, that, that I did. Uh, first was with Stu Friedman, who was a graduate student at UC Berkeley. In 19, uh, we published our results in 1972. And this was uh, the first experiment to actually test the CHSH inequality. In, the, in parallel with us, is a Cole I mentioned who is here, was working with Frank Pipkin at Harvard. And they got the opposite result. Whoops, one of us is, is in trouble. So they decided not to publish. They were skeptical of their results. But now I'm skeptical of my results. So uh, what do I do? Well, I decided, well, I needed to uh, repeat uh, their version of the experiment, which I did in 1976. And then uh, there's just along the way, one of our assumptions had, uh, and I was kind of searching for loopholes, uh, had required photons to act like particles. But I discovered that there was no actual experimental uh, proof that, that particles that uh, photons did act like particles. So I did an, an experiment in 74 to, to pr prove that. OK, so here is the, the first experiment, a picture of it. And that oh, the, at the uh, right end, there's a very young Stu Friedman. Uh, in the middle is a, an atomic beam apparatus sitting there pumping away, uh, oil leaking all over the floor, <laughs> pair of uh, polarizers on each side, which would, which would rotate. So, and this was, became uh, Stu Friedman's PhD thesis at uh, uh, Cal Berkeley. So what we did is we had a calcium b atomic beam and we uh, excited it with this UV lamp. Very weak as extension, we wished we'd had lasers, which didn't exist at, at the time. So uh, we got 6.3 sigma result, which, I mean, the five sigma uh, criterion that is uh, now common 
was invented by Louis Alvarez at Berkeley, and he he uh, was a, a, a strong taskmaster on, on, on any experimental results that came out of Berkeley. So this was the, the second experiment which I did. I mentioned uh, this was a repeat of the whole uh, Pipkin experiment. I used the same polarizers, but I used their uh, uh, source uh, of uh, mercury uh, for emitting, uh, creating the, the two photons. And Dick Hort, uh, Holt uh, very generously taught me how to do it. Uh, could not, uh, there's a, it's not an easy, and it, that is my Nobel artifact that I have donated is one of the, the sources. So it used uh, mercury uh, with an electron beam exciting the, yeah, the uh, atoms, and I got at least a, a four sigma uh, a result there. And we used this, this, the same protocol in, or, in order to uh, introduce the, the assumptions. So the exper other experiment that I mentioned had to do with did particles, was there a real wave, uh, experimentally demonstrated wave particle duality for photons? Photons started in 1917 when Einstein was trying to explain how do a, does a gas uh, and a, uh, a thermal uh, a Planck spectrum of, of light come to equilibri thermal equilibrium with, with each other. And he noticed that photons had to be behave by what he called directional e energy bundles. Uh, we now call them photons. Then Schrodinger noticed that so what's the difference between, ask the question, well, what's the difference between a particle and a wave? Well, a, 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 I mean, a wave could be just a, a cl classical pulse of light. And that is uh, commonly referred to as the old Schrodinger uh, interpretation. So how does one tell, tell them apart? Suppose you have a source and you send light through a half silver mirror. If it's a wave, the wave will go both ways, uh, uh, reduced intensity. If it's a particle, the particle will go one way or the other. Now, if I have two detectors on, uh, behind the, uh, uh, the half-silvered mirror, if it's a wave, they will both see this pulse, and there will be a finite uh, a probability that both will register simultaneously. If it's a particle, only one of them. So how does one uh, do that? Uh, so actually Schrodinger suggested this, and Yannese in uh, Budapest actually tried it, but unfortunately they put in uh, did, did, uh, an inconclusive experiment. So I went back and tried it, figured out how did one do it totally conclusively, and uh, uh, so I did it actually where you, the, using the, the, the same source that I used for the uh, producing uh, the, for the uh, Mercury uh, uh, Bell's theorem experiment. Uh, we had uh, photons going in both ways and two half silver mirrors. And using some uh, work from by uh, uh, Glauber's formulation, one could show that. The, the coincidence rate between here and here, there should be none, of course, if, uh, if it's a particle, but, but there should be an anomalous, if it's a wave, uh, a coincidence rate. The product of these two coincidence rates here and here uh, must be greater than the, the, uh, pro, uh, the product of these coincidence rates. And so here are the data, and it's quite, quite the opposite by about uh, 20 sigma. So indeed, particles do act, uh, photons do act like particles. So as I mentioned 
before, Mike Horn and I were trying to understand what it is that Bell's theorem experiments actually say. They, so we developed what's called the th uh, theory of local realism. Originally, we called it objective local theories, uh, our first paper on it. And it's an extremely general theory that uh, takes into account uh, all of the basic uh, elements of Einstein's platform. And uh, in, in along the way, we produce the CH inequality, which is actually a, a hard experimental prediction with no loopholes. We did not have any assumption of causality, which we had earlier on. There was no behavior requirement for a particle-like behavior. Uh, and then there was a, some discussion among various other workers, John Bell and Admiral Shimoni, added uh, additional components. To, so presumably, the, the more, uh, it is better called Bell, Clauser, Horn, Shimoni, local realism. It's very short-lived, as I mentioned. It was already dead on arrival. But it, that wasn't good enough. It had to really be shown to be dead with no loopholes to, to, by testing. OK, what does it assume? Localism is extremely simple theory. Anton Zeilinger, and please quote me, uh, uh, tell me if, if I am uh, misquoting you. At one point, he at a conference, he said, if Bell's inequality and local realism had been discovered before quantum mechanics, it is so reasonable it would have been taken as a law of nature, adapted as, as a law of nature. Uh, unfortunately, it's wrong. So what does local realism assume? It assumes that nature is made out of stuff. Um, well, uh, what is stuff? Well, we, uh, we may not even know what it is. It is, uh, it is what Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen referred to as elements of reality. It's what we call matter or uh, uh, what Clauser uh, Horn called objects. John Bell referred to it as beebles. It's there, it's distributed throughout space. Now, actually, Einstein's whole program, in general, in particular, goes a lot further. And he says, they say, says that, well, it has a finite mass energy density. And it, it is that density that determines the whole geometry of the universe. We don't need that for, for, for local realism. All we need is that it's there. So it could, it, it could evolve stochastically, or it could evolve uh, deterministically. We don't care. It's stuff, it's stuff you can put in a box. You could uh, surround it. And the stuff that's in the box, if you're doing an experiment, so the stuff determines the probabilities of the experiment that you actually do there. We assume that there are real results that happen when you do an experiment. That is, uh, uh, unlike uh, Schrodinger, actually, he, he thought the whole idea of the, the cat in the box experiment was a total absurdity. We assume that the cat is either alive or dead, and we just don't know which. That a real result always occurs. Presume that the properties of the stuff determine the results of an experiment you do. The, if you have a parameter setting on your apparatus, and then you change the parameter setting, presumably you will get a different uh, result. So what does it predict? Well, suppose you have two very widely separated boxes. Each has stuff in it. 
and you're doing experiments in these two uh, wide, uh, separated boxes. The, the assumption following Einstein's uh, requirement for locality is that stuff in one box and the, uh, the parameter settings, uh, can, the result of the experiment in one box measuring that stuff cannot be uh, influenced by the parameter setting choice made in the distant box. That's all you need to produce uh, uh, the, uh, the Clouser-Horn uh, inequality. OK, so here's what are boxes. Well, they're just closed surfaces. They separate, each closed surface separates, has a, an inside and an outside. So here we have a pair of boxes. OK, these characters are, uh, well, I made that drawing in 1976 uh, before the characters had been named. Uh, Alice and Bob, well, okay, so this, but she, but she's perhaps trans, I don't know. So, what, uh, here we have Alice and Bob making measurements, and they get a result, yes, no, on, on each side. So, we have our boxes here are now shrinking at the speed of light. And so there's drawn so that we're doing the experiments when there's space like separated. So if I plot in versus x in time, uh, here are the boxes shrinking uh, simultaneously and doing experiments. So the assumption is that stuff back here in the common overlap region is what is the result of of the experiments. Uh, if you read some of John Bell's stuff, you have to be careful. For some reason, he had these reversed. He had the arrow of time going to the left. Uh, I'm sure he had a reason for it, but I don't know what, what it was. OK. It's dead, Jim. Uh, apologies to Star Trek. It was, for a long time, it was very difficult to do. The, the technology just simply did not exist back in 74, but it has improved. So it became very important to eliminate the loopholes in the earlier CH, the tests of the CHSH inequality and uh, to really do a loophole-free experiment. And finally, most recently, at the labs in, uh, in Vienna and in Champaign, Urbana, uh, Illinois, uh, it has been totally killed dead. OK, now I will use what my time remaining to make a, uh, a value statement, if you will, about why I have the faintest idea what's going on. And I argue that, in fact, there's been a, an elephant in the room pardon the metaphor, that uh, has been hanging around ever since uh, Schrodinger and, and EPR. Remember that Schrodinger produced two very different equations. He had one for hydrogen with only a single particle, and he had another one for helium, which had two particles. Nobody seemed to concerned at the time about the fact that these two equations were formulated in very different spaces. And they are what I believe is improperly linked, and I'll go on to that in a minute, by what I call Born's ambiguity. Born was the one who, who said that they are equivalent. And this, this has been, the elephant's been hiding in plain sight. And I noticed that, in fact, the einstein podolsky rosen our debate, a uh, uh, Bohr debate, was never really settled. Various textbook authors b believed one or the other of uh, the authors, and there developed in the literature in the textbook industry two very different schools of thought. And most people never seem to notice this. But 
with the advent of local realism and quantum entanglement, then it became clear that one could actually uh, contrast and identify these two schools of thought. Okay, school number one, I assert, is essentially a form of local realism. So, what are the textbooks that promote uh, uh, the school number one? It is what I call the laboratory space formulation of quantum mechanics. Okay, it was taught, these are all, I, I kind of cut the, off the, uh, the list at, at about 1980. Begin first with Born, Born's textbook. Two very important uh, uh, textbooks, uh, uh, familiar Dickey and Whitkey and Merzbacher were very popular. Uh, all follow this. Uh, and like, for example, in Born's case, the waves are propagating in the lab. And he shows pictures of waves moving around. All of these books show waves in the, in the propagating through a two-slit experiment in a lab space. Feynman, uh, this is his review article, 1948, even puts it into the title. This is a space-time operation. Uh, French, French and Taylor, uh, used at MIT, and of course, the original classic, Schiff. Okay, what is school number one? Quantum mechanics for single particle systems is formulated in lab space or real space. The XYZ of this room, it had, there is a sp point, every point in this lab space has a vector to it. And Schrodinger's wave function is a function of its position uh, in the room or in the lab. And more importantly, the probability density, psi star psi, is a function of the, its position in the room. It is the evolution of, of these waves is governed by Schrodinger's equation in lab space, and it, it depicts Waves of probability, you probably heard any number of people describe quantum mechanics as waves of probability. Moreover, there's also, defined by Born, a conserved uh, probability current, which flows like a fluid through, through the lab. And he famously used that uh, of current to describe flux conservation in Rutherford scattering. Unfortunately, it only works, uh, the, the, slab, the uh, school of thought number one only works for single particle systems. It cannot describe two particle systems or and it cannot describe entanglement. So what's school number two? <coughs> also had a, a large group of textbooks which uh, very specifically said we are in configuration space. Okay, probably one of the most important ones, but Beta and Sal Peter with the authoritative work on hydrogen and helium, Jorkin and Drell, relative uh, quantum mechanics, Conan and Shortly, uh, how you uh, calculate spectra of atoms, Landau and Lifshitz, great quantum mechanics textbook, was translated by John Bell, actually, and Messiah's famous book. Uh, Except he, he claims he's in, quantum, in configuration space, but actually he cheats a bit. Uh, and probably most importantly of all was von Neumann's textbook. Okay, what is the configuration space school of quantum mechanics? It is a very, very different from what I just described. The wave function depends on a system's degrees of freedom. Uh, this comes, uh, there could be many of them. Uh, there could be k degrees of uh, some not large number k. And so we have a wave function. And these are all, this is straight out of von Neumann's uh, book. So if you have, say, 
two uh, particles in helium, then now the argument space of the wave function is very different. It has an xyz of particle one, xyz of particle two. Wait, our lab does not have six dimensions. Something has dramatically changed. Importantly, the position in the lab is not one of the arguments. That means that its value is the same everywhere in space, unlike the lab space formulation, that it, where it's different every point in space. So Schrodinger's equation now is very different. It's describing the evolution of particles in this configuration space. It's an abstract mathematical uh, space. It is not at all this, the space uh, that Star Trek was exploring. The, uh, a few important, and it's absolutely required if you want to discuss uh, more than one particle systems. Born's conserved uh, currents cannot be drawn in uh, configuration space. Green's theorem does not apply. More importantly, the, there is no prohibition for propagation of signals faster than light in configuration space. It's a purely uh, ar uh, arbitrary space. Totally abstract. It's what the mathematicians call a vector space. Not at all. So it has been asserted. And I, as far as I could trace back, this was originally to, uh, to Borden's uh, talk that uh, these two cases are, are the same. They are not. Clearly, the, the two uh, wave functions are very different. They are not equivalent. One depends on the position of space. One does not. There are no associated probability waves. Uh, for configuration space. So for my last slide, I will describe why I find this all totally confusing. You've got to have configuration space in order to uh, describe more than one particle systems. But there's no reason uh, that the special case of single particle systems should be any different. So you need, uh, so, and we notice really that the f lab space formulation is really a form of local realism. It's dead, Jim. So uh, now all of these great models conceptual models of probability waves propagating in space are also dead. The flow of currents, probability currents, are dead. I don't know how to visualize propagation in configuration space. Uh, there are a lot of people here who know a lot more quantum mechanics than I do. and. <laughs> Maybe one of them will help me understand what does it mean to have a wave propagating in configuration uh, space. I don't know. Uh, Dick and Wiki and Merzbacher were on my side. They both say, gave up and said, oh, gee, you know, this is all our, our great models, i.e., our earlier uh, sections of the book we really should throw, throw away. So I have one final challenge to my theorist friends, if I still have any. <laughs> Remember we said that, that general relativity uh, is a form of local realism. So, and it is a general relativity that, for example, gives us black holes. So, but that's all formulated 
in under a, a, a local realism theory. So my challenge is to the theorists, is it possible to have two entangled black hole spins? Thank you. So uh, our final speaker is Anton Zeilinger. Uh, he was born in Ried im Inkreis, Oberösterreich, Austria, in 1945. Uh, he studied undergraduate physics and mathematics at the University of Vienna, from which he also received a PhD in physics in 1971. He is currently professor emeritus at University of Vienna and senior scientist at the Austrian Academy of Sciences, where he also served as president until recently. Uh, please join me in welcoming Anton Zeilinger to the stage. Off. Okay. Yeah, hello. Uh, I am really happy to be here and I'm grateful to the Swedish Academy of Sciences and its various committees to have elected me as a winner of this year's prize. I would like to, in the beginning, also appreciate some basic facts. One is the fact that I was born into a location at the time where it became possible to do such work, which was actually a close call. I was born uh, uh, two weeks after the end of World War II. I am grateful for the family where I came from, my father and my mother, who, who really uh, fostered this kind of curiosity which I had. They never told me what to do, but it was clear that to be curious is important. I would like to thank the, my family for enduring me, my wife Elisabeth for supporting me very strongly and also uh, she made her own, they say, compromises in her career for me. And I'm grateful for my children and for my grandchildren that they bear with me. But last and, and somewhat maybe foremost, I would also like to thank the taxpayers. The taxpayers in Austria, in Europe, even in the US, who give us the money to do this. And that is really a big privilege. I would like to dedicate my lecture to these two people who were very important for me. One is Helmut Rauch, my academic teacher at the university who unfortunately passed away three years ago. Uh, I worked in his group in Vienna in an environment where fundamental work was the obvious thing to do. And I know that this was very special. There were not many labs in the world where this was 
so easily possible. And from Helmut Rauch, I also learned that you uh, can have ideas which are wrong in the sense that if you argue and see, and the arguments are wrong, but the idea is right. The intuition can be much stronger than logical argument. And that was very important for me. The second uh, person I dedicate this uh, uh, lecture to is Mike Cohen. He has already been mentioned by both speakers before. He unfortunately also passed away uh, three years ago. Uh, uh, I will mention a little bit more than what you heard so far in, by my previous speakers. My entry into the foundations of quantum mechanics was uh, the fact that Rauch, Treimer, and Bonze in 1974 had developed a neutron interferometer. Neutrons are massive particles, and for the massive particles, the opposite than what, what John showed, for massive particles, the particle feature is obvious, but the wave feature is the one you have to show. And uh, this was known for a long time, but they built a beautiful interferometer, which is this, this, uh, 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 does it work? No, it doesn't work. It doesn't matter if it's work, it works or not. It's this E-shaped thing, uh, uh, with, uh, made of a perfect crystal, which splits and superposes uh, quantum states. And with that, I was not participating in the development, but I had the idea in 75 to use this to demonstrate what is known as four pi spin or rotation. If you turn anything around by, by two pi like me, turning around, I'm the same. If I were a neutron, I would have to turn around twice <laughs> to be the same. It's the phase which is different. And this we showed in that experiment. It's actually, to me, it's one of the first experiments which uh, later uh, was so obvious that nobody mentions again how important it is. It's used in quantum computers all over the place and, and all this kind of stuff. Right? Uh, then in 1976, and this is important, I think, for all of us, just a year after we had done uh, the experiment, I discovered a conference organized by uh, John Bell and Bernard d'Espagnat in Erice in Sicily, which was called Think Shops on Physics, Experimental Quantum Mechanics. I went there, I presented this experiment. And at the conference, I met Alain, I met uh, John Clauser, I met Mike Horn, I met uh, basically uh, all the players in the, in the field. And they talked about entanglement, I, and I did not have the foggiest idea what they were talking about. <laughs> I really did not understand it, but uh, it took some time. Uh, in the meantime, we worked on other fundamental experiments. It's my journey. As I said, my journey through quantum wonderland. I want to tell you today, one experiment is this famous two-slit experiment. Uh, has been mentioned by, by John already. Uh, it's a picture from the dialogue between Bohr and Einstein, uh, where you have a situation where, where some radiation can be particles or can be light, can pass through slits here in the middle and they form fringes. And the question is to which slits they to go through. Right? And uh, the, the modern way to say it is that, that uh, uh, the fringes back there only arise if they, you can nothing say about where, which path they, they went. They themselves don't know it. Nobody in the universe knows it. And I say, even God, even God doesn't know it. So this, is, this information is not there. So we did the experiment. Uh, uh, Gela, Schall, Treimer, uh, and Mampe with me with uh, very cold neutrons at the reactor in Grenoble. What you see here is the distribution of neutrons with a solid line uh, uh, being a first principles theory with no free parameter. Now today, this is obvious. In the old day, when I gave this talk, even famous professors in the first row cut up and said, it really works that way? One particle by one particle. They told them, what would you expect? That's what your theory says, you know. And this kind of experiment also allowed us to put limits on the uh, possible, um, possible hypothetical nonlinearities of quantum mechanics. Another important per person in my life was Cliff Schall. He was a professor at MIT. I worked with him 
on neutron interferometry. He got the Nobel Prize in 1994, and I was here actually for the Nobel celebration. Uh, I learned from him one thing, and that is do every experiment at least one magnitude more precise, one magnitude better than what you think is necessary. And it always pays off. Then another interesting thing happens in 1985. 1985 was uh, the 50th year of the einstein podolsky rosen paper. And in, uh, uh, in the fall of 84, I come in in the morning to the lab, and Mike Horn says, do you want to go to Finland? And I said, sure, any time. Yeah, there is a conference in Finland uh, uh, about einstein podolsky rosen So we said, oh, we have to invent a way which connects interferometry with einstein podolsky rosen and that way, we invented this einstein potolsky rosen interferometry, where instead of spin, where the two states are up and down, uh, this is two different ways of propagation. And the same mathematics, the same physics, and this was the first suggestion of using external variables uh, for this kind of uh, einstein potolsky rosen work. Uh, in, in, uh, in, that, uh, in, 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 in the situation, this is not quite common. Uh, in, in, uh, uh, what happened at that time is that uh, parametric down conversion as a source of entanglement uh, came out and showed, uh, show, gave us sources which are much better, much intense, much cleaner, and so on than atomic conditions. Uh, it, it discovered, this was discovered by Bern and, and Weinberg in 1970, and the Mandel group started to do experiments in 85, and Ellie and she in 85 did the first EPR test on, on, on uh, using down conversion. And we proposed in 89 this kind of uh, experiment with momenta, which is just what you see here. Uh, and that was, was performed by Rarity Tapster in 1990. Pray uh, Tapster uh, in the Chow Group in 1990. At that time, something else happened. This is my journey through the world. Something else happened, which was interesting. In '84, Danny Greenberger, who is here in the audience, came to Vienna on a Fulbright Fellowship, and we sat together and uh, discussed what can we work on, to, uh, uh, on uh, 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 what kind of project. And we both had been thinking of maybe it's interesting to look at three particle entanglement, not just two, which sounded okay, something okay to do, you know, but uh, who says that it would be interesting? It turns out that this was, this was mind boggling. Turns out that if you have a three particle entanglement, like written down here, three uh, uh, polarizations of photons, uh, then you can have a situation that where upon measurement of two, you can predict with certainty what the polarization of the third one is, but the local realist would uh, predict the exact opposite than quantum mechanics. So it is not a statistical contradiction. Before, I had thought naively the difference between quantum physics and classical physics is statistics. No, it's not statistics. It's a, def it's a definite opposite. And uh, here, here are the three of us uh, talking about this kind of experiment. And since 1988, this was my goal, this experiment was my goal, and it took us 10 years. And at that time, we had no idea how to create entanglement of more than two particles. Uh, we had no idea uh, 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 of, this, of the proper source. We have no idea about how, 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 how to measure it and so on. All this was developed over, over the time. Uh, and so, so, so and th I say this so strongly because today in many applications when you apply for money, you have to write down what your goal is, what you want to achieve in five years, and you have to write down which methodology you want to lose. This would have been completely impossible for the, for the GHZ experiment, <laughs> completely impossible. In the meantime, so then, in, and then something else happened in, in 19, uh, 90, I moved to Innsbruck, and they suddenly had a lot of money. 
because of this new position and so on. So I could really buy everything. I could buy the down conversion crystals, the first one. One of them is now in the Nobel Museum, uh, etc. Here's an experiment we did. Uh, it was the first experiment with down conversion in our lab, where we pump a crystal. This is the blue pump, and the two, the green and, and the red uh, 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 photons come out. And what we do, we send the pump back, so we create another pair, but actually it's the same pair. One pair creates the same pair, either sent this way or sent this way. And then you put in mirrors, and then by uh, moving any one of the mirrors, you can, you can suppress uh, the interference and so on, which is a, an effect that cannot be identified as effect on one photon only. In 1905, uh, 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 important thing which happened was that Proquia joined my, my group also, besides uh, uh, the, the first collaborator in the experiments was, was uh, Harald Weinfurter. And when he came, we decided to do these experiments, but we had no idea how a laser works, really. We had to learn everything from the scratch. In 1995, uh, uh, Quia joined us and we developed uh, this new high-intensity source for entangled photons, which became the workhorse for a, for a very, very, very long time. At about the same time, uh, the uh, uh, quantum information uh, became a fledgling young bird, you know. Uh, it all started in 95 with Stephen Wiesner, uh, who suggested that if you can print the number on a banknote uh, with quantum states, then it cannot be copied. This is a, an idea far ahead of its time, and it was only published in '83, in, in a, a part, a support by John Bennett in a in a cryptic uh, journal. Uh, uh, this idea had already had the feature of no cloning. It's important that you cannot clone a theorem, which was later formulated by Wouters and Zurich: randomness of the individual in, event and complementarity, and the name Qubit was uh, uh, then uh, 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 invented by Ben Schumacher, the general superposition of zero and one. And here's our, uh, our experiment on, on dense coding in experimental quantum communication, which is, as far as I know, the first application of entanglement in a quantum communication scheme. So you have a source which produces entangled photons, and then uh, 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 you send them through this diamond here, and you superpose them on a beam splitter again, the two photons. And by ma manipulate, manipulating only one of the two photons, you can encode four different informations instead of only two in a, in, in a classical polarization. In, in practice, it was only possible to encode two or uh, three because of limitations, uh, but that's a separate, separate history. And then finally, uh, this is uh, 96 with Mark Shukowski uh, uh, and, and Harald Weinfurt and Mike Horn. We have very long dis been discussing how to create three particle entanglements. And in, 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 in 96, uh, fin we finally found it. And the basic idea was that you pump the left, the left image you pump a crystal so strongly that you create two pairs at the same time. And then you, you uh, superpose the beams on the, on, the, on the beam splitter up there, and one of the photons you let uh, propagate away, this is called T, the trigger. And then if, they, if you uh, detect them in very short coincidence, much shorter than the coherence time of the radiation, that was one of the important ideas, then the other three photons are, are entangled. And a similar thing can be done to create four photons. So we had now the tools in our hand, and these tools uh, which we had in our hand, we discovered were useful to sort along the way to do other experiments which had been proposed. One experiment was quantum teleportation proposed by by uh, Bennett, Bazar, Crepeau, Joseph, Perez, Wouter, shown here, together with their cat. I don't know whose cat it was. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Uh, 
Uh, and when that paper came out, uh, uh, don't misunderstand me. I thought, this is a typical theoretician's idea. It's completely impossible to do it. And I was completely wrong, you know? I did not realize that we had started to work in that direction. The, the tools we developed for GSZ we could use here. And that we did. One of the tools is the behavior of two photons at the beam splitter. You take a beam splitter and you have two photons incident, one from above, one from below. And then uh, what can happen is uh, uh, that both, if you, if you, uh, both photons can be, can be reflected, both can be transmitted, or one transmitted, one uh, uh, reflected, and so on. If these are so-called symmetric states, bosonic states, then uh, the point is that the probability that both are uh, reflected or both are transmitted, they extinguish each other. And therefore, you get, when you put the de detectors here, you get zero coincidences uh, if, it, if the flight time difference is zero. This was discovered by Hongu Mendel. Unfortunately for photons, three states are symmetric. So you cannot use it to discriminate states. But, but, but luckily, one state is as anti-symmetric. And for this anti-symmetric, the two photons come out always in different states, and only in that situation. So that was an important workhorse. By that way, we could identify one Bell state, one entangled state with certainty. So here is the experimental setup in Vienna for uh, quantum uh, uh, teleportation, the quantum state teleportation over just one, just one meter distance. And they are uh, the friends, colleagues participating in that experiment. You see some of them on the picture look much younger than they look today. And some have not really changed when you walk, walk around. Harald Weinfurter is here, for example. Tian uh, Weipan also doesn't look much older than, than on that, that picture. Then the next, uh, the next idea, also along the road to GHZ, was was uh, entanglement swapping. It had already been suggested by Bennett, Bazar, Crepeau, Chosa, Paris, and Wouters that you could actually teleport one of the entangled states. And if you do that, then you get two photons which are entangled, you know, two entangled pairs, two photons which are entangled, which have no common past, which never met each other, nothing completely independent. Uh, we call this teleportation swapping. And uh, uh, we performed it right after the uh, bell, uh, after the, 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 after the uh, uh, teleportation. Uh, this has now become a center stone in future quantum networks that you can connect over lo longer distances with you know, entanglement swapping and so on. The first experiment was done by Chian Pan and by Thomas Jennewein in my group. That's an in-fiber uh, experiment where you use a beam splitter, uh, which is just a, a fiber coupler. And we actually were able to show a violation of Bell inequality for the independent photons, for those who have been generated completely independently. Uh, and the most important uh, thing here is, is uh, an idea by Asha Perez in 2001. He said, OK, you could have these two pairs, and you could actually register the outer ones uh, right away. Write them down, print them out, whatever you want. Permanent record. And the other two, you can decide at a later time whether you subject them to an entangling measurement or not. If you subject the other two in the middle, to an entangling measurement, and the other, then the outer ones become entangled, even if they have been registered already. If you don't do, then they are not entangled. The same data are not entangled with each other. So what is going on? The data is certainly invariant. But the meaning of the data, the very physical meaning, depends on a measurement which you do at a later time. And uh, uh, 
Arthur Perez says that we only have relational bits. We only can say something about relations. Uh, the quantum state doesn't give us what is really going on because that's a different, a different, uh, very different way to talk about things. That's an experiment we did uh, uh, in 2012, Shazong Ma's uh, thesis, where he did the the, the, the top uh, yellow uh, uh, violet thing up there is the is the apparatus which decides whether to measure the photons separately or together. Uh, it's a it's a switchable beam splitter, so to speak, and lo and behold, we get entanglement. So the fact that two systems are entangled or not can depend on future experiments. And so, the, the, to me, this is a corroboration corroboration of of uh, Bohm's Bohr statement: no phenomenon is a phenomenon unless it is an observed phenomenon. Okay, it might relate to what you said in the end, John. <laughs> okay, here's finally the GHZ experiment, just the way we uh, we had proposed it, and here the uh, this uh, the, these kind of multi-particle entangled states are now common in many com uh, quantum computing schemes. There's one important message I want to say here. When you look at the predictions of quantum mechanics for multi-particle entanglement, so you could have one measurement here, one there, one earlier, one later, and so on. These predictions are completely independent of the relative arrangements of these measurements in space and time. And that tells you something about the role in space and time. It has no role at all. How much time do I have? Six minutes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Very kind. <laughs> here, here are the pictures of now the theories and the experiments on the on the on the uh, GHZ experiment. Published in 2000, more than 10 years after we decided we want to do it. Uh, I mean, had we known the solution in the end, we had, could have done it much faster, right? But this is always this is always a different story. Now I want to say, tell you we were not doing nothing besides that in my group, and this is just an overview until uh, 2010. We did a number of, of quantum computation experiments. Some of them have be have become important in the field or not. I show you that because uh, it, it's, it's interesting, it's fun at the time, but I personally uh, 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 did not follow that up. I'm still interested in the foundations. And I still hope that someday, that I still live when someday we, we find the answer. <laughs> also the answer to your question. Now back to Bell tests. Uh, 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 Alain has already mentioned this experiment very, very kindly. And I would like to thank you, Alain, because when Gregor Weiss started to the experiment, there was a little motivation problem. And you came and told him, do it. It's very important. It can be very, very positive. So thank you very much. I think do it better than our experiment. I didn't, I didn't hear that. Yeah. yeah, do it better than your experiment was. Sure, yeah, yeah, right. This was, very, this was very good, yeah. So we did the experiment. We heard already uh, the essence. Uh, two photons are created in the down conversion source, and they are sent to two glass fibers uh, 300 meters apart, and there were rapid op electro optic switches, uh, which switch the polarization quickly, uh, by, driven by a, by a real random number generator, a quantum random number generator, okay? Both sides. Uh, yeah, actually, this, these electro-optic switches are also donated to the Nobel Prize Museum uh, uh, because they were very crucial. Uh, 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 there were new developments. You couldn't buy them in that quality uh, uh, much earlier. And that way, we were able to violate the Bell inequality very nicely. Uh, we were able to apply it to quantum cryptography, entanglement-based quantum cryptography, al already, also already uh, mentioned suggested by Eckert. There were parallel experiments in the Kuyat group and in the in the Shizai group. And that's the image. It's a strange language which I use here. We, we encoded the picture of the Venus von Willendorf. It's a famous uh, figure discovered not far from, from Vienna. It's about uh, 30,000 years old. And you know why we choose the Venus? 
It's a, because my, my, my friends came with a bomber or with a tank they wanted to encode. And I told them, you have to some, use something which is, uh, which is Austrian and with beyond any doubt a peaceful symbol. <laughs> So we took the we took the Venus here. Yeah. We took the Venus of Willendorf, and it's the first time, and so far the only time, that a, a naked lady was pictured in physical review letters. <laughs> <laughs> so so far for that. Then you know the story goes on. I'm I'm coming to my end. Uh, we started to do long distance experiments, for example, between Canary Islands. Many I can only. I can only show you uh, the image of one of them. Uh, this is an ideal location. On, the, you have, on both islands, you have clusters of telescopes, which, which we can use if we can convince the owners of the telescopes. Then another sort of experiment was closing the loopholes, already mentioned by, by both speakers in, in 2015, a beautiful experiment by the Hansen Group in Delft, uh, by the Weinfurter Group in, in in Munich, presented the, uh, nearly at the same time, at least I heard for the first time about that in 2016, and our experiment and the experiment done, done in, in, in Boulder, Colorado at that time. And that is actually a picture of John Bell uh, using images of all participants in the experiments. If you look closely, you see a picture of, and also of Bohr and of Einstein, you name it. Now here's a curiosity about our about the development of our field. These are the citations of the einstein Podolsky rosen paper from 1935. And you see in the beginning there are only three citations. They're not so bad because two are from Schrodinger and one is from Bohr. <laughs> <laughs> but afterward it stopped. The problem was considered settled or just philosophically uninteresting. And it comes up again in the, in the 1990s. Philosophical discussion comes up again. And, and you know, at the time of Bell, after Bell's theorem in, in, in the 60s, it starts strongly and it still goes up. And now the paper is, is by far the most often quoted paper by Einstein. And it's uh, quoted nearly twice a day. But this does not mean that it is read more often than in the old days. <laughs> it's actually very difficult to read. It's not, it's not an easy paper. Now, two things for to kind of uh, uh, preparation for the coffee break. Uh, one of the questions is, in principle, in principle, and just for the fun of it, the word can be, can be a, one minute, uh, could be a, a big conspiracy. Maybe there's some earlier cause which influences the, the, the random number, the, the sources and, and, the, and the detectors and so on. So what are the most independent early causes you can have? Well, uh, uh, we thought this was a uh, suggestion by, by uh, uh, Kaiser, uh, Friedman, and Galicia to use something very far out in the universe. So we took quasars quasars out by billions of years and took the random numbers, random, randomness in their light to, to trigger what's going on. It was a beautiful experiment up, up on the hills there in the night, in the, you looking to this quasar, looking to this quasar and so on and then to the Bell experiment. Uh, uh, the question is how can you go from here just to provoke a little bit. The next uh, point is use cosmic, the cosmic microwave uh, background, the next zero minutes, yes. Then we can go to, can go to uh, 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 neutrinos, early neutrinos, or we even, and this is extremely speculative, maybe someday we can use primordial gravitational waves, which from the Big Bang. But so far I want to end. That's, just, that's my paper with the largest number of co-authors. Uh, what we did there is, is uh, uh, we did uh, 13 experiments on, on five continents, and there was a random number generator done by everyone. There were people participating, typing random numbers into their mobile phone, and these random numbers uh, 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 choose the, 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 uh, the, experiment, the, the settings of the experiment. Because, as John Bell said, you know, he's one of our big 
profits, human choices should be considered free variables. And here, in the end, I close, I close with this uh, picture of the Mitsio satellite, which uh, you may have seen. And I end. I want to say, I want to say what my uh, 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 view of the world is. Maybe, maybe I would suggest maybe the separation we do between reality and information is artificial. Maybe we need to unify the two. And here is a picture of all the people I ever published with over the years. Everyone appears only once here, when it was the first time. But this is only, only half of it. That's the second half. <laughs> and I want to thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank all these people. And Toll. The yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, can I please ask uh, Alan Aspe and John Klauser to join so that we can thank all three speakers for their fascinating talks?